next up is Dr. Shafi Goldwasser. She's a Turing Award winner for her work on cryptography and a professor of computer science at MIT, UC Berkeley, and Weizmann. Today, Shafi will be talking about how you can use mathematics for verifying AI algorithms. Turning it over to you, Shafi. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shafi Goldwasser. I'm a professor at UC Berkeley and a director of the Simons Institute for Theory Computation. I would like to tell you today uh, a bit about how can we use more mathematics to address the growing distrust in algorithms. So uh, I'd like to start your talk in uh, telling you about California Proposition 25, which was on the ballot last year. And the proposition was supposed to approve uh, something that passed in the California le legislature, uh, a bill which proposed to replace cash bail with risk assessment tools. The idea of the bill had two parts. One is to end cash bail and replace it by bail, no bail without any money involved. And um, in addition to have a risk assessment system put in place, which will decide whether to let someone out on bail or not. Um, and this will be done through a machine learning program. So when we say risk assessment, we mean a machine learning algorithm which I'm sure you all uh, know about, given that you're attending this conference. It's in machine learning is in the intersection of AI, statistics, theoretical computer science. For the sake of this talk, I don't wanna give a specific, precise definition right now, but it is an algorithm which learns from and makes predictions on data without being explicitly programmed. So somehow past data is gonna teach us how to make decisions about future uh, cases. So what was the debate in the case of the California uh, bill? Essentially, the supporters of the bill said something that I think nobody can disagree with, and that is the cash bail system is inherently racist, classist, and unfair. People who have money can commit horrific crimes and go out on bail. People who don't have money can commit small crimes and stay in jail. Um, so everybody seems to agree, except for maybe for the bond industry. But what do the opponents say? The opponents say two things. One is the bail industry again, so somebody who stands to gain money by having cash bail doesn't want it um, obliterated. But the interesting thing is that civil rights advocates were very much against this bill. And the reason is not because they think that cash bail is better. Obviously, it's fundamentally flawed. But their position was that if you're going to replace it by a risk assessment system, by some automatic machine learning algorithm, you might be replacing one bad system with another, which is going to last now for the foreseeable future. So a quote from a website that I saw is, while algorithms can pitch you a song or sell you a toaster, they should not be used for release decisions. The factors considered for release will still lead to people of color being held for trial at disproportionate rates. Proposition 25 is further from existing problem, but no closer to the solution. So this really is representative of this basic distrust in algorithms that a um, essentially is pervasive. I wasn't that surprised that the bill didn't pass, even though one should really be aware of not passing it because the consequence is that cash bail is still in place. Uh, the reason I wasn't surprised because a few years earlier, we ran a workshop at the Simons Institute, which I'm the director of, on racial bias and the tension between numbers and words in a non-internet data. To my surprise at the time, uh, the pervasive, um, sentiment uh, between uh, among the social scientists and uh, lawyers was that you know risk assessment complicates or undermines many bedrock democratic values standards of accountability and so forth and um, essentially they felt that without governing namely ungoverned data-driven assortment uh, assortments are creating new forms of stigma disparate impact and group discrimination so what do we mean by governess by governance. So governance, um, if we, if you ask a lawyer, they will tell you should be particip participatory, responsive, inclusive, follows the rule of law, accurate and efficient. And the way they feel is that if you use a computer system, a risk assessment system, it is possibly accurate and efficient, but it certainly doesn't supply all those other uh, requirements. And the examples of governance that you would get, again, if you talk to a legal professional, is the markets, you know, the corporate boards, they provide governance, uh, law and regulation by their definition provide governance, in terms of norms and ethics, your peers may provide governance, and then there are 
uh, several technical types of governance, of code, of data, standards that people apply to algorithms. But in this specific example of using machine learning or risk assessment algorithms in another name to make decisions such as bond, uh, no bo uh, bail, no bail, or giving you a loan, not giving you a loan, and so forth, um, we need a different kind of governance. So me, as a computer science person, if you ask me what kind of governance we need or what we should be concerned about, there are probably three things. Now, this slide is very dense. I don't presume you will read it. So let me explain what are the three things that are minimum at minimum. And this is before talking about privacy and other issues. First of all, who is it that actually built the machine learning algorithm? Who came up with the risk assessment uh, program deciding bail in the case of uh, the California bail system? Namely, since it's a machine learning algorithm, it's based on data. What past data? What kind of access does the algorithm designer have to? Um, where did they train it? Did they train it in the cloud? Was it a secure environment? Second question is, okay, let's say that some company developed machine learning uh, assessment and uh, they say, here it is. Is that enough? Uh, how do we verify that it works? What does it even mean to work? Uh, is it verified? Do I have open source access to the algorithm? Do I have open source access to historical data to check the algorithm against? And in what formal sense can a machine learning algorithm be verified to work, to be functional? And finally, even a bizarre question, which is not so bizarre, since a case like this has come about in uh, the New York forensic, um, using of forensic uh, programs, uh, how do you even ensure that the algorithm that you verified is the one that's actually going to be used in practice and not some patched up version? And the third thing is, let's say you have gone through those two steps. Somebody built a machine learning algorithm with access to the right past historical data, and then it's been verified by another entity. Um, this is all good and well and good with respect to past data. What about future data distributions? Are they really gonna be addressed by this past system? Can you guarantee that if the distribution of people who are um, gonna be decided on, you know, their features have changed and they've never been seen in historical records. Uh, so can you actually generalize from past data to future data? Are you robust against uh, someone manipulating their features just in order to get out of on bail, even though they shouldn't? Are you fair against minority populations which may have not been represented in historical data? So those are the type of things that as a computer scientist, we should be concerned about, but perhaps more optimistically, we might be able to say something positive and forward-looking about that will address and alleviate the concerns or at least a subset of the concerns of people who distrust algorithms. So now I'm gonna to have to do something a little technical, um, but I'll, again, no need to read the slides, I'll speak um, through them. So if we look at a formal definition of machine learning, there are many, but one of them is due to Les Valiant from 1984, it's very simple. It says, you're given a bunch of labeled examples, which if you like to think about them, it's a pair of features. In the case of bail, might be the person who is being considered for bail where they live maybe, what the crime was, what their history is. And then uh, there's features and then prediction. That is, should he go out on bail or she or not? And mathematically, I write this as X, meaning features and F of X, which is either zero or one, which is go out on bail, don't go out on bail. So I'm giving lots of examples from the past decisions, maybe of judges. And I would like the algorithm, which he calls a uh, pack learning, which is probabilistic, with high probability and approximately correct algorithm to efficiently look at all these examples and come up with a risk assessment system, which I call H. It's a hypothesis that agrees with the historical data, you know, as best as possible. So with high probability on inputs, which are similar to what you've seen in the historical data. So um, how do you verify so let's say that was the first question. Somebody is gonna come up and try, look at historical data and come up with an hypothesis. Let's go to our next question. How do we verify that they've done their job well? And this hypothesis really agrees, you know, with high probability with past data. So we have a lot of tools in our arsenal to verify correctness uh, for algorithms, not necessarily machine learning algorithms. There's something called program verification, program correctness and checking. 
interactive proofs for program delegation to the cloud, zero knowledge interactive proofs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some of you know these, some of you know a subset of them. The issue is with all of them is all of the existing verification tools are really verifying that a program that they were given behaves according to some pre-specified um, function. And the thing about machine learning is that there is no un, you know, specified function. We're learning from the data. It's not that somebody told us the rules and told us what to code up. They gave us data and asked us to come up with a hypothesis that agrees as best possible with the data. So said differently, we don't really know what the ground truth is. We don't really know what F is. So what are we supposed to verify? We're supposed to verify that this risk assessment ML program agrees with the data. And we need a formal definition of what that means. And the first work that I wanted to tell you about, uh, which deviates from the past, is uh, a paper uh, recently written with uh, some colleagues of mine, Kai Rothblum and um, Jonathan Schaefer and Amir Yudayov on interactive proofs for verifying machine learning. Again, it's a mouthful. In other words, I want to be able to verify the accuracy of the model, the hypothesis that was generated with respect to a distribution as compared to the best hypothesis that can be learned. So the data has in it a lot of information. The first company that did the machine learning came up with a hypothesis based on the data. And I want to know that they've done the best they can. And I want to be able to define what that more precisely. But before I even do that, I'd like you to think of the setup. There are sort of two parties here. One is the learner slash prover in red, and they learn an hypothesis by accessing the distribution of data, you know, the features and the verdict, like in the previous slide. Remember, we have an X and F of X. X is the features, F of X is zero, one, um, which is the verdict of the risk assessment system. And on the other side in green, there is an other algorithm called the verifier algorithm. And the verifier algorithm gets information from the learner back and forth, back and forth. And at the end, it says, I agree, this is a good hypothesis. I verified it or I reject it. The thing is that the verifier could we have relearned this by themselves? Who, why did they need the, the learner? And the answer is because the learner may have a lot of time to do this. They may have ac full access to the distribution. The verifier needs to do this quickly and may have only a few samples from distribution, it might have different type of access. It cannot run experiments, possibly it can just get some random data in the distribution of features X and decisions zero one F of X. So um, and what we'd like, again, this is a fairly formal definition, so let's just talk through it. We would like to say that an hypothesis class is PAC verifiable. So before we talked about probabilistically and approximately correct, now we want to say probabilistically and approximately verifiable. If a verify algorithm, like the green box, a, can achieve completeness, soundness, and efficiency. What do we mean by that? We mean that there exists a learner that will send you an hypothesis in case that he achieved a really good hypothesis, which is close as possible to the optimal, close by epsilon to the optimal, then the verifier has a procedure where he can scrutinize this a uh, hypothesis, a code, and say, yes, I accept. Soundness is sort of the more interesting challenge. And that is, let's say that the learner is not doing his job properly, and he's sending you an hypothesis that is not accurate as, as much as possible. In that case, the probability the verifier will agree should be low. So soundness means you will not accept risk assessment systems, which are far from optimal. And by efficiency, or in the slide we call it double efficiency, we mean is the the learner who's trying to prove this to the verifier should not work too hard, uh, and the verifier should be should not work too hard. So both of them should be efficient, but the verifier should be even more efficient. So his job should be much easier than that of the prover, otherwise he doesn't need the prover. Okay, so let's apply this, this mathematics to a setting of, cloud of, a, of the cloud delegation of machine learning. I'm a verifier. I go to uh, a prover, which might be a company, and I say, listen, here's my task. I want you to develop a program that does, um, you know, bail without cash, you know, uh, just looking at historical data, or that does go loan, give, gives loan to applicants, or accepts people to school, or decides whether um, a program that you post to YouTube is, uh, you know, obtain 
contains uh, pornography or not and is appropriate to post. And now the prover, who's the cloud, who's got a lot of uh, computational power, uh, you might have a lot of high quality data, trains a good machine learning algorithm and returns it. And now this verifier checks the model on some random data, sees it has 80% accuracy. Should he or shouldn't he say, yes, this is pretty good. Well, is 80% accuracy the best you can get? What we want to say is that the verifier should accept it only when uh, this thing on the left, which is L sub D of H, what I mean by that is the this hypothesis H that he got from the prover is the loss of it or the quality of it is as close to the optimal quality, you know, as possible, let's say not far, further away than epsilon. And it might be given a hypothesis easy to estimate how well it does. It's not so easy to estimate what's the best that can be done. And what you want to check is that you're not too far from a best. So that's the challenge. And, um, you know, those who are interested are invited to read this paper to understand how can we actually check that uh, by talking to um, the learner slash prover that what they gave us is close to optimal. So how to achieve completeness, soundness in an efficient manner. Um, so efficiency is very important here. You'd like to ask whether verifying can actually be in principle cheaper than learning. Uh, a, can they fundamentally differ and have a, a much easier verification job? And the answer is yes. And there's a lot of work in uh, different uh, mathematical theorems on this. Here's one example is that sometimes you can have really very significant qualitative and quantitative separation in the type of data access where the prover might need to really run experiments so, and look at the data, give it features and cut back what would be the verdict in such a case where the verified, that's the prover, a learner and the verifier just gets sample data of the past and you cannot ask questions of its choice. And you can still verify achieving soundness, completeness and efficiency, uh, talking to an untrusted you know, prover who came up with this machine learning algorithm. Uh, you can do this in case of linear regression. There are a lot of very interesting work that's being done right now on this topic. Um, I just want to say that I started saying that um, lawyers and legal scholars are kind of dubious about algorithms. So now we've supplied them with some more mathematics which a way, with a way to verify the accuracy of an algorithm. But how would that really fit within legal norms? Um, I'm giving them some proof which is correct with high probability. A mathematical proof which is correct with high probability. How do courts view probability? So there's some very nice reading that you could find um, this particular paper was called Statistics in the Court, Incorrect Probabilities. And it goes through cases going back to the 1800s where, um, you know, people were convicted uh, because um, they were accused of some crime and then arguments of the falling sort, probability, this was about forging a document, the probability that finding 30 downstrokes was once in, I don't know, two millions of millions of millions cases. And based on that, they judge, well, it's unlikely that this was uh, um, an honest mistake. It must be a forgery. This was a forgery of a will, a, or an alleged forgery of a will. But it turns out that um, it's very, very tricky because this uh, argument that was made in that particular case assumed that a whole bunch of events were independent of each other. And it's unlikely that first would happen and the second would happen and the third would happen. And this is called the product rule and probability. So the probability of all of them happening at the same time was very low. But it turns out in reality that those um, probabilities in these events are not independent. So the probability they all took place was much, much higher than what they argued in court. This happens all the time. You know, probably the most famous case is the O.J. Simpson trial uh, with a glove where they said, uh, if it doesn't fit, you must quit. You know, it had to fit exactly. Again, we know that's not exactly accurate either. So you would need courts that understand probability theory, understand base rates. And um, I think the lawyers are willing to uh, engage, but it will require a shift. Another question you may ask is uh, what about open source access? So when, let's say in the bail case, a company came up with code, will it give its code in open source to a verifier to the government? Not so clear because this is considered proprietary information. They might want to use it in another state. Uh, in principle, we have techniques uh, to verify algorithms without looking at, at the open code. And that's what's called zero knowledge proofs. 
Um, in a minute, I'll say what that means. But in principle, the idea is that um, you could commit to your code in an encrypted form, and you could essentially prove um, every time that the verifier asks you to run the code that you're actually uh, executing the code that was committed to an encrypted form. And then you do that in something called zero knowledge. So, so some of you know what zero knowledge, some of you don't. I'm not gonna really go in detail. I'm just gonna tell you the crux of the matter. Essentially, these are uh, proofs that reveal nothing but the validity of, of the statement. So you could say, I prove to you that, you know, I know my, that, that this, I give you an encrypted password and I prove to you that uh, what's being encrypted there is the password or many other, any other kind of mathematical statement instead of looking at the proof in the clear, which will give you a lot of information, like the password itself, I can prove to you that I know it and that's the password that will let me into my account without actually providing it. Um, and uh, the issue is that in principle, uh, in the past, this has been used for passwords, it's been used for blockchains, for validating transactions on blockchains, preserving the privacy uh, of the, transa the transaction, the anonymity of the people who are engaged in the transaction. It's been proposed to use in the context of DNA identity testing, DNA innocence proving, even in nuclear disarmament, though I won't speak about that here. But the question in terms of the law is uh, much deeper. That is what we're doing here is we really are decoupling um, the, the legal challenge of verifying a claim in the context of what I've talked so far, the claim is that the algorithm I came up with is a good um, machine learning algorithm from knowledge of the facts, from the knowledge of the algorithm itself. So in principle, always in law, you're supposed to give evidence. Here, I'm not gonna give you the evidence, I'm gonna to prove to you that I have the evidence and the evidence would have convinced you had you been able to see it in, in its entirety. So it's an interesting question, how would legal scholars even view this idea in principle? And this is the subject of another paper that is about to come out in the Berkeley Technology Law Review Journal. And um, we went to some legal scholars and, uh, in Berkeley Law School and we asked them, how would lawyers view this idea of decoupling, uh, verifying the claims from knowledge of the facts? And what they surprisingly uh, pointed out to us is the law is full of trust problems involving verifying digital information, where verifying the facts by one party, such as a potential contracting party or a litigation adversary or a government agency, requires disclosing a substantial amount of sensitive information, which in itself, this disclosure creates immediate risk of misuse of disclosed information, either deliberately deliberately or um, just being stored somewhere could later be stolen. And to address this currently in the law, there are legal doctrines like NDAs in the case of you know, disclosing information between companies and other laws, but they don't really work. So whenever the disclosure benefit is less than the disclosure risk, so let's say in an NDA, uh, they might still take your invention and that's a disclosure risk, the benefit is that maybe you've two companies talking to each other and they've decided to merge. But whenever the benefit may be lower than the risk, people just avoid doing it altogether. And those are uh, four examples of the type of law where this comes up and where zero knowledge verification might replace what is being done today. Privacy law is one. That's like the password. Like you want to authorize that someone um, is... Uh, you know, he holds a EU passport, but not which country they're from, or something that will prevent aggregating personal identifying information and still allow to verify what you need. In deal making, uh, if you have two companies who want to make a deal, which requires revealing information to each other, uh, there's some very well known economic uh, paradox called Arrow's disclosure paradox, which tells you that you really cannot go beyond your firm for to look for economic opportunities like merging, like selling your you know, technology, unless you're protected by law, which means that a lot of deals are not made. So that's a, a big verification dilemma. And let's say in trade secret litigation, somebody stole your software, you claim that in a court, then the other side says, show me your software. Um, maybe you don't want to do it. A, and then in administrative law, which is essentially the cases where, let's say the police has um, decided that they have enough evidence 
to convict someone or of a pornographic ring participation. But then the, the um, you know, the um, defendant could say, well, show me your evidence, show me the program that you use in order to snoop on my website. And the police wouldn't want to give the program because it means that they won't be able to prosecute other criminals. So it's sort of the, it's the disclose or dismiss dilemma. So these are all examples of dilemmas where disclosure might be worse than what you're trying to achieve. And each of them points to a potential use of zero knowledge proofs, which will make the law not just more efficient, but more nimble, more expressive, more precise, and also enable greater accountability of government adversaries. Uh, there's, of course, a challenge of how to take this from theory to practice. And, you know, some of this stuff has been done. A lot more has to be done. You know, there are challenges like pinning down what the data is that's relevant. How do you encrypt it and commit to it? What exactly is the precise statement that you want to prove about it? Who are the stakeholders? Uh, and which flavor of zero knowledge? Um, and um, I want to just two more slides. I just want to leave you with the thought that this is not just abstract mathematics. For example, there's a case in New York City where it turns out that they developed a forensic statistical tool designed to statistically analyze complex mixture of DNA found in crime scenes. And it turned out that in practice, they were using the wrong program that has been patched, but not the original program. So this is, is actually a challenge that can be addressed by proving that the program in place is the original program using, let's say, a zero knowledge tool. You can think about proving the tax audits were really selected in an unbiased manner, that stress tests of financial institu institutions comply with regulation. These are just the cases that are out there and are closer to um, taking place than more generic things like litigation and deal making and so forth, which I think are a big promise for the future. The last word is that I would like to, you to know that the quest is res not restricted to achieving privacy or accuracy or using zero knowledge proofs. There are many algorithmic tasks which have societal value and have legal doctrines to back them that we now can consider the use of algorithms for, but we need to mathematically formulate what is the legal doctrine and show how to formulate it, show it to legal scholars, get their approval, and then um, achieve it algorithmically. So in addition uh, to the right to privacy, there's anti-discrimination doctrines, there's uh, duty of care and negligence, copyrights, all of these can be formulated mathematically and hopefully can be achieved to the satisfaction of legal scholars as well as computer scientists. Thank you very much.